to keep going. I have one more if you want. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Violet, that was wonderful. You're welcome. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> you get better every year. We probably should book you for next year so, uh, before you become a famous concert pianist and <laughs> have you. a tour. Yeah. Thank you. Way out of our range at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, folks, we're going to um, get started, but I'm going to quickly, Paige, do you have anything you want to share with the Hi. world here? Hi everyone, my name is Paige, I'm part of the library. We're here for the Central Oregon Writers Guild annual holiday reading. Just a quick note, you are being recorded. What that means is when you talk, you will be recorded. So if you don't talk, you won't show up on the final recording. And we're going to turn it over to Mike to take it away. All right, um, thank you Paige. And thanks, uh, thanks Paige specifically in the library in general for um uh facilitating all this stuff for us it's been a it's been a little bit of a challenge through the pandemic but we're excited to be uh in january we'll be back in person in the library um we will still be offering zoom uh, um, a zoom aspect a virtual aspect to the um to the meeting so you can still watch them live and interact from home if you're not uh, comfortable going out in the world yet, which I completely understand. Um, we have put together a fantastic lineup for 2022, and I have to thank the board uh, for all their help in this. And uh, uh, I think we're 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 going to have a lot of fun this year. I'm going to do a quick screen share of our um, web page here. Um, this is our, our landing page of our website, the meetings and events page, and here we are at our uh, December uh, meeting, our, our member reading, and I'm just going to briefly go through what we've got coming up in 2022. So in January, uh, four of your board members, including me, Denise, uh, Trish Wilkinson, and Julie Swearingen, all are, we're all professional editors, and we're going to do a, 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 an editing panel. We'll talk a little bit about um, the common things that we see in editing and then do a, a generally a Q&A. Um, 
February, we've got Krena Castlebaum. She's going to do a creative writing play shop images that shimmy and shake. We have a woman named Deborah Fresh who's going to do um, a Mind Your Words workshop, and she's a, an editor and publisher. In March, we have our first workshop, and these workshops will be on Saturdays. And this is going to be Mining Your Life for Laughter with Bob Balmer, a humor workshop. That's a three hour workshop on Saturday, March 19th. I'll be posting links to the workshops to, so that you can register. Remember, $10 for members, $25 for non members for our workshops, and meetings are always free. In April, we've got Bridget Lewis. She's going to talk to us about dialogue. Uh, on the page and in the imagination. Uh, that's, a, that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, Jennifer Silva Redmond um, is, uh, I think she's the pitch witch, and she's going to talk about how to pitch stories or how to pitch your work. Uh, June 14th, we're going to talk, we're going to get some agents in, and we've got a few lined up already. So we're going to have an agent panel, and we're going to talk to agents about what agents do and what agents want. Second workshop of the year is Julie Swearingen, and she's going to talk to us about social media um, and all those TikToks and uh, tweets and all that sort of stuff. So that'll be a, a useful piece of marketing information. Our old friend Kristen Dorsey is going to uh, talk to us about resuscitating work that we may have put away. Uh, we are going to have a local author panel. We've got a few people lined up already, and we'll probably get a few more. Just insights from local people, people that, are, that live here in Central Oregon about the writing world. Uh, we have a woman named Erica Berry who's coming to us from um, Oregon Literary Arts, and she's going to talk about research uh, and generative possibility. And this will be a really interesting one, too. She's got um, possibly more information that we'll be able to fit into that time. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, September workshop, uh, Philip Kenny wrote a book called The Writer's Crucible uh, about meditations on emotions, being and creativity. So this will be a, a, a great workshop. He's done this workshop several times uh, in different writing groups. Uh, a friend of mine, a new instructor at Oregon State University and writer, a graduate of the OSU uh, Corvallis MFA program, is going to talk about seeing around the narrator, Catherine Melsinski. Um, we've got a surprise guest presenter, and the reason it's a surprise is because we haven't quite figured out who it's going to be yet, but it's going to be an instructor, one of the instructors that comes in November for the residency for the OSU MFA program November workshop. Leva Moss is going to talk to us about uh, marketing, our uh, book marketing, and she is she's done a workshop for us before. Great stuff, really, really, really interesting information. Um, and then again, our December meeting, we'll, we'll be right back where we are here with the holiday party. Also on this page is a list of writing events in Central Oregon. So here's what's left in December. Um, if you're interested in submitting to the Timberline Review at Willamette Writers, uh, tomorrow's the last day for that. Um, the library is doing a, a critique group workshop. And I don't know if that's posted yet, is it? Um, it is, okay, it's posted on the, yeah, obviously, because there's a link to it right here. So click on that, that should be pretty cool. I'm, I'm excited for that one. Uh, Sarah Sears got her winter program that's gonna start in January through March 8th. Um, and we've got authors, we have writing salons, we have a bunch of, COCC is just full of classes. Um, January, February, March. Look at all the COCCs. There are some in person, a lot in Zoom. Um, so lots and lots of cool stuff coming up for writers in 2022. And that's all I got on that. So I'm going to pass it over to our featured reader coordinator, Mary Krakow, and she's going to introduce our readers tonight. Um, let's uh, mute ourselves while people are reading and feel free to put comments in the chat. If you love something, just put it right in the chat and our readers can certainly follow this as we go. So that's it for me. Mary, it's all you. Mary, you're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Paige. Um, as far as the introductions, I'm just gonna tell you who's reading and what the title of their piece is. Um, we had 10 readers 
scheduled. One um, has asked me to read her piece for her, and and one um, I don't see here tonight, so we may just have nine readers. Okay, so our first reader for this evening is Cameron Prow. Go ahead, Cameron. If I unmuted. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mike was talking about, I think, in other words, the road that stories take to get to the public. I started this story, this, uh, I say Christmas of 2002 under another title. I had it critiqued by writers, groups, and friends. I actually read it under another title about four years ago with Central Oregon Writers Guild. It got honorable mention last year's children's literature contest. And then I was contacted by a member of the um, Dry Canyon Arts Association. They wanted to do a book illustration workshop at St. Thomas Academy. And then of course COVID interfered, but we managed to put that on in May and it was a success. I really enjoyed working with the children. They asked insightful questions. Oddly enough, the youngest kids, uh, grades three through five, asked the most questions and the sixth through eighth graders didn't have much to say. Although I did speak with a couple of uh, young men young boys uh, who were already trying to use their writing or their find an outlet for their words and their feelings through writing. So it was great to be able to encourage writers coming up the pipe. Anyway, um, I wanna get out of that. And this is my first time reading any story on a screen. So let's hope I do okay. So this is now called Elmer's Miracles, and here we go. Not tall enough, too flat on one side. Elmer's branches drooped at words he'd heard many times. He wasn't good enough to be a Christmas tree. A few years ago, a frisky breeze had stirred to life the ashes of a campfire in the clearing where he lived. The sparks had set the underbrush on fire. Flames from the brush had leaped higher, burning the evergreens he looked up to. The fire had stolen half of his perfect Christmas tree shape before jumping past him and racing through the forest across the tree, excuse me, across the creek. Elmer's new branches on the side the fire had burned were much shorter than the bushy ones he used to have, giving him a lopsided appearance. I need a little bit more room here, okay. His tree friends farther from the creek bank where he stood were black skeletons now. Why had he survived? Elmer yearned to see the ground around him bloom with seeds from his cones, but none had rooted in home soil. The few cones he produced each year had been blown far outside the spread of his branches. Then a miracle occurred. An unknown seed sprouted where his trunk met the ground. Being needed felt marvelous. He'd done his best to help the young birch seedling, pulling his own branches closer to his trunk to give Bertie room to grow. Taking care of Bertie had been like having a sapling of his own to raise. Protecting that spindly twig will make your branches wimpy, warned the new evergreens in Elmer's clearing. Elmer didn't care. Helping Bertie grow had been worth the sacrifice. One summer day, Elmer heard a high-pitched squeal from a young girl walking with her father through the woods. That one, Daddy, she said, pointing one of her skinny branches at Bertie. I want that one for my table. A man with a mistletoe-like growth near the top of his trunk patted the little girl's back. Good choice, Joy. Birch don't usually grow next to evergreens. Don't know how it survived. The man's two husky limbs cradled a strange creature. It had a skinny grayish branch on one end with silvery buds spinning round and round. The other end growled as it belched a steady stream of blue smoke. The man pushed the busy end against the bottom of Bertie's trunk. It tickles, Elmer, Bertie giggled. What should I do? Relax, Elmer replied. <coughs> You'll be fine. 
Bertie, deprived of his root support, toppled toward him. Elmer's skimpy branches caught and held Bertie one last time. I'll never forget you, Elmer, Bertie said. Nor I you, said Elmer. I wish I could go with you, but this is your chance to see the world I can't. I'm happy for you. Elmer's words sounded hollow, as if he didn't believe what he was saying. Bertie slid out of Elmer's embrace to lie on the ground. The man loaded Bertie on a cart. Then he and Joy pulled the cart out of the clearing. Elmer's branches sagged, sadly. Bertie would never stand beside him again. Elmer missed Bertie every day, but tried to look on the bright side. Bertie's bare branches, so unlike Elmer's green ones, would never shiver in the snowstorm again. That thought didn't warm Elmer's heart as much as he had hoped it would. The squirrels used Bertie's stump to crack nuts on. Elmer liked thinking the stump left behind was giving back to the forest some of the love Elmer had shared with Bertie. One cold December night, Elmer found himself surrounded by fireflies. In summer, they gathered around first one tree, then another, blinking their bright messages before winging away to places Elmer knew he would never see. Tonight, the cheery host twirled and twinkled around his branches like fairy lights, as if foretelling a wondrous event. A bigger light swung closer and he saw it was a lantern. The man who had taken Bertie walked around the clearing, looking at Elmer from different angles. Expecting him to turn away as had so many others, Elmer was startled when the man spoke. Not too tall. Your flat branches could go against the window. Perfect for our small house. Elmer felt the tickle Bertie had as the noisy creature with the blue smoke pushed itself against him. Crack! Elmer bounced once on the ground, then lay still. The man pulled him onto the same cart Bertie had ridden and led him down the trail. A long time later, Elmer found himself planted again in a red tray with dark green roots. The cave where he now stood was much warmer than the clearing he had left. Thirsty, he drank the water in the tray at the bottom of his trunk. Joy and her father draped green strings on Elmer's branches, then hung brightly colored cones and finished decorating with silvery icicles. Unlike the ones he was used to, these icicles didn't drip in the warm cave. One by one, Joy carried red, green, and blue packages from a wooden table near Elmer to a snow white carpet under his bottom branches. Then from the table came a voice he had never expected to hear again. Elmer, is that you? It's me, Bertie. The man pushed the end of the green cord hanging on Elmer's lowest branch into the wall, then pulled a black cord out. The lanterns in the cave went dark. Joy and her father stood hand in hand, waiting. All at once, fairy lights sprang to life, dancing around Elmer's green branches. Yes, Bertie, I'm here, he said, cherishing the second miracle in his life. He and Bertie were standing side by side, together again. The end. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. I see a lot of people are doing their, uh, the reactions with clapping. So that's excellent. <laughs> Even if we can't hear it. Um, yeah. And I will. Right. Right. Thank you all for the opportunity to share this story. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Trudy Forti. She'll be reading an essay, The Gathering. So um, again, a reminder, if you, uh, Trudy needs to unmute and the rest of us need to mute. Okay. <laughs> hey, thank you, Mary. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the Gathering. I pull up to the cafe under dark, threatening clouds, my mind in overdrive after a long, intense day spent in a writer's workshop on the Oregon coast. I need a place to sit and unwind before continuing the long journey home. 
I get out of the car just as the sky opens up and drops buckets of rain. Tugging my coat up over my head, I make a mad dash up the steps and throw open the cafe door to be greeted by the pungent smell of onions and hamburgers cooking on the grill. A, a corner booth stands empty and after shedding my coat, I slide in. The lone waitress comes over with a glass of water and wel welcomes me with a cheery hi. I scan the menu quickly, place my order, and then lean back with a sigh. It is a small cafe, one of the many small cafes found at highway junctions throughout the Oregon coastal range. Once frequented by loggers and truckers, it is now lo the locals from the surrounding area that stop in, together with the occasional group of tourists headed for one of the many small towns that dot the Oregon coast from Astoria to Brookings. Lulled by the warmth of the cafe, I relax even more into the cushioning comfort of the booth and reflect on the day's workshop by the well-known Oregon writer, Brian Doyle. Throughout the day, Mr. Doyle spoke of the stories that unfold around us every day, stories that speak to love and courage, heroism, even the most mundane acts. It was these stories that he felt compelled to tell and urged us to tell as well. Story catching, he called it. And it was clear that for him, story catching had become a sort of sacred trust. Suddenly the door swings open and a group of women in their late fifties enters, each holding a gaily decorated bag in her hand. They call out greetings to the waitress carrying burgers to a nearby booth and the cook behind the counter before joining the friend who has been holding a table for them. Once orders are placed, the group turns in unison to one of the women and cheers as a shiny paper crown is placed on her head and gifts ceremoniously piled in front of her. I watch her friends' faces, the pleasure that washes across them as she exclaims over their cards, how they each light up with excitement as she searches for the gifts that have been carefully tucked amongst explosions of brightly colored tissue. The affectionate teasing as each gift is opened speaks of friendships formed over months and years of experiences shared, from baptisms, first school days and birthdays, to weddings, divorces, and funerals. The words of Mr. Doyle still fresh in my mind, I watch and wonder about their stories. I imagine that their stories are not that different from those of the many friends I've gathered with over the years, like that of Kathleen, who is facing another round of chemo after hearing from a doctor that the cancer has returned, or Kay, who is struggling with the fact that her spouse with whom she has spent so many years planning for retirement is no longer with her because of a terminal illness. I think of Carol who gets up at 6, 6 a.m. five days a week to join, to pick up her grandchildren so that her newly divorced daughter can search for a job in a troubling economy. And finally, I think of Michelle, the last one to leave any gathering drying out her goodbyes for as long as possible before returning to a dark house and a husband sprawled on the couch, beer bottles lying scattered on the floor. As I watch the women gather before me, I know that these are not their stories, but they do have stories and their stories are known page by page to each and every one of them. For this is what women do when they gather whether it is a small cafe tucked amongst the tall firs of the Oregon coast, a tiny town in the Australian outback, or a small fishing village on the Mediterranean, women with lives that are sometimes hard and sometimes filled with moments of grace come together to be present for one another, to honor one another's stories, to bear witness to lives lived, and to reach out with gifts, with laughter, and a warm touch to say to one another, you matter, you matter. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Oh, Brian Doyle, what an inspiration, right? Mm. Okay, the next reader was unable to read this evening, but she passed her um, selection on to me and I will be reading it for her. This work is from Connie Gilbert. Um, it was published in a book called Celebrating Christmas. Um, 
The profits go to the Samaritan Purse and they provide relief and emergency funding. And at this time of year, they actually um, provide boxes for Christmas. Christmas boxes. So um, I will be reading Connie Gilbert's The Miracle of the Christmas Rabbit. Every time I trim the Christmas tree, I am reminded of the story attached to each ornament. The plaster of Paris and beaded felt ornaments I made for our first Christmas together. The baking soda ones I made the next year. The, the unique misshapen ones were handmade by my son each year at school. Others represented our vacations and the musicals I directed. Before I hang this clown, let me tell you its story. As the children's choir director, I chose the Christmas musical for both my choir and the Sunday school children. Each year, I looked for a fresh approach to the Christmas story so the children would enjoy, learn, and not get bored by the time we presented it. Reaching the hearts of the parents and guests was an additional challenge. In 1981, I chose the Christmas musical fantasy, Super Gift from Heaven by Betty Hager and Fred Block. The story takes place in a toy store. At midnight, the dolls, clowns, stuffed animals, and toys come to life. They are worried about what happens when they are sold and what people mean when they say, when they call them gifts. The main character is an Easter rabbit that was never sold. Her role was played by a teenage girl who wore a gray rabbit costume. As the story progresses, the antique dolls from the creche explain the meaning of Jesus' birth. The dolls, animals, and toys learn that gifts are not just things, but also actions. This leads them to sew up the Easter Bunny's torn seam and replace her vest with a green and red one for Christmas. The rehearsals went well, and Sunday arrived to present our musical gift. The costumes were on and the props ready. The moms added the finishing touches, rosy cheeks, whiskers, and powdered noses, Dolls, stuffed animals, toy soldiers, and clowns lined up for small drinks and last minute bathroom visits. As the excitement and anxiety increased, so did the noise level. Soon we would pray and head upstairs. The sanctuary was nearly full, but the rabbit, along with her costume, was missing. After a few frantic phone calls, it turned out our teen was with her father. Even though he had known for weeks about the musical, he would not let her leave for church stuff. I found our pastor and asked him to start the service with a few Christmas carols. He agreed without an explanation. Then I looked for a special gray-haired lady, took her to the foyer, and asked her to gather a few prayer warriors. I needed heavy-duty spiritual guidance to pull this musical off with no rabbit. They gathered and prayed and I went to the pastor's office to figure how to salvage the night without disappointing the children or the audience. As I prayed and skimmed the script, I heard the carols. I peeked into the sanctuary. It was full of moms and dads, grandparents and guests eager to see their young ones. A few latecomers were seated in the foyer. I went downstairs to quiet and line up the children for their entrance while I continued to pray for inspiration. I was deep in thought when the back door slammed. There was our missing teen. She dashed in with her rabbit suit flying behind her. The children and my helpers cheered as a mom rushed to get the makeup for some whisk whiskers. Tell me later what happened, I called after her. Humming, oh, what joy, we're gifts. From the musical, I started the children down the aisles. The congregation was unaware that a near crisis had been avoided. However, the prayer warriors smiled as our rabbit with her long floppy ears skipped on cue down the center aisle. By the close of the musical, the toys and dolls realized they could only be a gift to one child or one family. But what makes Jesus the super gift is that he is a gift to everyone. We can all receive the super gift from heaven. For me, the greatest gift was the sparkle in the children's eyes and the tears throughout the audience. As they filed out, I watched as the children received well-deserved hugs and kisses and encouraging words from their families. Oh, what joy were gifts in action. 
once everyone was headed home, our teenage Easter bunny turned Christmas rabbit told me what happened. Her father had berated her all day because of this church stuff you've gotten into and became verbally abusive after my phone call. In the midst of his screaming at her, he threw her the car keys and yelled, go. She ran before he could change his mind. I told her about the prayer warriors who did not pray for me as I had requested. Instead, they asked the Lord to touch her father's heart. God did. I doubt her father ever knew he had given us a gift that night. Our rabbit, an evidence of a miracle. Each year, as I hang this clown ornament on a tree, I remember my son was a clown in super gift from heaven, which will always be known to me as the miracle of the Christmas rabbit. A small miracle compared to the birth of Christ, yet God still is in the miracle business. And that's the story from Connie Gilbert. Connie, do you want to say anything? Okay. Next up, we have Amy. And Amy Berlin will be reading a short fiction called Your Song. Hi, everyone. Um, well, now that we're all in the holiday spirit, I'm going to read you a super sad short fiction story. <laughs> so stay tuned. Okay, this is called Your Song. It's a peculiar feeling watching your father say, I do, to a woman who isn't your mother. It's a moment that will define the rest of you forever, the same way peeing in your pants in second grade will or your first French kiss. Something primal in my throat growled and I felt like eating my hand. We're officially no longer a family. I wondered what my mother was doing right at this very moment, probably on mile 11 of her elliptical machine. Skinny is its own prize, she loved to say. As soon as the bride and groom made their way down the altar, I started my own processional to the bar. I was still pretty and just young enough to pull off flirting my way into an entire bottle of Chardonnay from the bartender. I took it up to the venue's loft where I could avoid my father's sisters and cousins who acted like all of this was normal. Not even bothering with a glass, I gulped down the buttery liquid. Geez, and I thought I hated weddings. I turned around to see a young girl, no older than 13, join me where I sat on the dirty carpet overlooking the dance floor. What are you doing up here, I asked. Isn't it obvious? The same thing you are. Since I'd barely eaten all day, the wine sloshed around in my stomach like a water balloon. I already felt the luxurious warm glow of tipsiness and it was as soothing as a bubble bath. Hey, I know you, you start as a flower girl. The girl framed her face like she was in Madonna's Vogue music video and then rolled her eyes. Excellent pedal tossing, five stars, I said. Don't you think I'm a little old for this crap? I think you're a little young to be saying things like crap. I noticed her high top Converse sneakers and chip green nail polish on her stubby fingernails. So how do you know the lucky couple, I asked. Bride's my aunt, you? Groom is my dad. I heard about you. Only daughter, parents married 30 years, mother is still fighting for alimony. Ouch, what an elegant Hallmark card greeting. Hey, my parents divorced a year ago and now my dad is living with some hooker, so I know the feeling. You shouldn't call other women hookers. Why not? That's what she is. She hunted my dad down like an antelope. I considered this a moment. I had never thought to ask my father how he met his new wife. I knew from the Facebook photos that they had behaved like they'd known each other longer than their six month courtship. I heard in my head the many midnight calls, me begging, please, let's be a family again. Him begging, please, don't you want me to be happy? Suddenly I felt very stupid. Hey, your nose is bleeding, the girl said. Oh, I pinched my nose and tilted my head back. The girl disappeared from view, her sneakers squeaking back down the stairs. A few moments later, she returned and handed me a wad of toilet paper. Thanks, I mumbled. My nose always bleeds when I'm stressed. What are you stressed about, she asked. Her eyes were patient and calm like there was nowhere else she'd rather be. I took another swig from my now warm wine. My dad asked me to do a father-daughter dance with him. It's hard for me to participate in this new family funhouse. So don't do it, she said. It doesn't work like that. Why not? Seems like you're trying a lot harder than him. You don't even know him. The girl shrugged. What's your name anyway, I asked. Victoria. 
You don't seem like a Victoria, a Vicky Mamie, maybe? She pantomimed Barfame. I hate it. My parents have a thing for old lady names. My little sister is named Eugenia. A shift in the downstairs music caught my attention. The song the DJ was playing faded to a murmur and then Elton John's Your Song came on. That was my cue. The wine in my stomach gurgled its way up and gnawed at my throat. I slugged down some more and stood up, watching my father search for me in the crowd. The song was only two verses in and I saw him reach instead for Jessica, his new wife's daughter, only a year older than me, but with shinier butterscotch colored hair. He twirled her and gave a heedless, it's my wedding day smile. My body slurped back down to the floor like a loose ramen noodle. I let out an involuntary yelp. I wished I could dissolve into the stained carpet. This was definitely more humiliating than peeing your pants. I watched as they shimmied their way across the dance floor while family and friends clapped and adored them. As if the hundreds of times we danced together like this in front of our big brick fireplace was just a dress rehearsal. And now today, it was the performance he was always meant to give. I'm not important sprouted like a swallowed peach pit in my stomach. I felt Victoria's hand perch on my shoulder, its heft offering the comfort of a grandmother. Looking over at her, my face hot and sticky, I said, am I still bleeding? Wow, love that. Sounds like it's from personal experience. <laughs> no, not at all, it's fiction. Oh, wow, very nice. Okay, um, thank you. Our next reader is Judy Dugan. She's going to read a piece, I believe it's memoir called Amelie. Judy? I'm Judy, here. you're muted, there you go. There. Um, some have heard parts of this. Um, nobody's quite heard the way I pulled it together at the end because I just finished typing. So we'll give it a go. A creamy foam leaf tops the latte with my name on the cup and I admire my barista's skill. I once attempted a simple heart during an espresso making class. Mine was lopsided enough to look heart-like only to me. Yet I grinned anyway at my first and only crema and milk foam latte art. Just the smell of the fresh ground beans from Ethiopia, Kenya, Colombia, Guatemala, and coffee plantations on hillsides across the temperate and tropical world make my eyes a little brighter in anticipation. Glancing around, I casually, and no doubt incorrectly, cast our background of other coffee seekers in the upscale Los Gatos Starbucks. Several, I decide, are work from anywhere techies with their laptops. Could that be a novelist? More likely a technical writer. Perhaps that one is a 30-something retiree who cashed out his startup stock when it went public. Definitely around us are Los Gatos homeowners, who became millionaires solely by virtue of that one purchase, even without choosing a gingerbread Victorian, a teardown would do. And there's one well-dressed family with children too small to be in school. Across from me, Rachel sips a fruity frappuccino, her warm, dark eyes smiling behind the glint on her glasses, eyes that match the coffee without cream of her velvety unlined face. How is it possible that just 20 minutes after meeting this woman with words alone offered in a slight accent, a blend of her ethnic village roots in Western Cote d'Ivoire, or as we call it, Ivory Coast, with overtones of colonial French and the British from her nursing and public health education in London, she painted images of such graphic inhumanity I push away from the table, my hands held up in front of me as if they alone could hold back the riptide of feelings, dragging me under, drowning me. Air, I need air. I hold up just one hand now in a gesture I hope suggests I'll be back. I walk outside, eyes blinking in the bright California sun, tears streak my face. Civil war and massacres in West Africa. 
that's as unrelatable for me as images on the nightly news of Syrian refugees blocked at the border of Turkey. Even when she told me about seeing an associated press image of her beloved great uncle, closer to Rachel than a more distant grandfather, sunglasses propped over his lifeless eyes by his killers and a cigarette butt wedged between his cold lips, his head mounted on a pole. Horrifying for Rachel, no doubt, yet so far from my world, I just could not imagine such a thing in my own little comfortable life. It, it was Rachel's story of Amelie that broke me. So Rachel, I say when we first sit down, as I told you on the phone, I'd be glad to be a sounding board, but I'm just a donor in a giving circle. I know nothing about starting a nonprofit. What do you have in mind? I grew up in Ivory Coast, she begins, occasionally taking a sip from her drink. We had civil war for there many years. Up on the West, like the former president, which is where most of his supporters live. So to tip the scales of the upcoming election, his presidential challenger sent mercenaries on a killing rampage all along the peasant farming villages of the West. Tens of thousands of Ivorians either died at their hands or fled across the river that creates our border with Liberia. Many who fled are still in refugee camps in Liberia, afraid to return home. I lean forward and nod as she speaks, absorbing the gist of what she says. Bad things happen in some distant part of the world, Rachel's part of the world. I try to recall if I have even the slightest idea where either Ivory Coast or Liberia fall on a map. Nope, not a clue. Well, one clue. Ivory Coast must be on the water. Narrowing down its location, hardly at all, given that the absolutely enormous African continent is pretty much surrounded by water. I have flown to Liberia several times now, Rachel continues, to travel to a refugee camp there. Each time I meet with traumatized Ivorian women, almost all from other villages than my own, women who were raped and brutalized, often left for dead. Many saw their husbands, children, parents. I listen to their stories and I pay for medical treatment, more medical treatment than they can get in camp. I've spent so much, I'm tapped out but I still want to help them. So I thought I could start a nonprofit to raise money so I can continue to give them support, but not just with medical care. I want to help them rebuild their lives, to learn how to start a small business and for younger ones to finish their education. Liberia offers some classes for young children in the refugee camps, but Liberian teachers speak English. Ivory Coast was a French colony. Our children speak French or our ethnic language. Rachel pauses. I just want to help my people. Rachel, I cannot imagine doing what you've done. Most of us feel pretty good about making comfortable little monthly or annual donations. You saw a problem and just took it on. Whatever prompted you to start this mission of yours? Rachel pauses to take a deep breath and sip through her straw. My family was vacationing in England, she says. My husband and I met in London when we were both students, so we wanted to take our children there. One day I opened my laptop to check my email. Yahoo has all these headline stories you can click on. One was about a new massacre in Ivory Coast, the day after the new president, president's inauguration promising peace. I saw pictures and read names of members of my own family and neighbors from my village. I was in shock. In my head, I was screaming, but my children just heard me whisper, whispering, oh my God, oh my God. What are you saying, mommy? They asked, what's wrong? So to answer your question in truth, 
I began visiting the refugee camp because of my cousin, Amelie. Did she go searching for Amelie in one of the camps, I wonder? Amelie was like a sister to me, Rachel continues. She was so sweet. We grew up together as children. Now this I can relate to. I think of growing up with my own sister. My firstborn sister was already heading to college when I was still in elementary school. So it was my middle sister, Pat, I remember growing up with most. Somehow, just as Rachel describes Amelie, Pat was just born sweet and thoughtful, still is. I remember one day, mom was uncharacteristically frustrated with little Patty. You only think of yourself, mom said. And years later, when I reminded her of this, mom could not imagine how she could ever have said that to sweet little Patty. Pat's little brown eyes filled with tears, but mom, I always set everyone else's place at the table first, she said. I remember thinking, really? I always set my own first with the best unchipped plate and the most perfect silverware, no bent fork times, no spoons that had been chewed up in the garbage disposal. So I could relate to growing up with a sister as sweet as Rachel described Amelie. As a young child, Rachel continued, I couldn't figure out why Amelie crawled like a baby, even though she was a few years older. Turned out she had polio very young and her lower legs were paralyzed. Our family had no money for a wheelchair. They were rare in our part of the world. So Amelie dragged herself along the red clay paths of our village from place to place. She wore flip-flops on her hands and strapped slippers over her knees that were calloused hard as rocks. I took so much for granted as a child and still do today. Like the cavalier way I treated my expensive to replace retainers after my parents paid dearly for my braces, leaving them on lunch trays at school, at ski lodges, and finally I just stopped wearing them, letting my teeth go back to the way they were before braces. Our family saved for years, Rachel said. By the time we could finally buy Amelie a wheelchair, she was a teenager. Then a young man got Amelie pregnant, but he was ashamed of her and afterward wanted nothing to do with Amelie or the baby. So Amelie rolled from house to house, braiding hair to make a living to raise her son. Amelie's mother also gave birth to it uh, at that, uh, close to that time and then died suddenly, leaving Amelie to raise both her own son and her brother as if they were twins. I had twins, I thought, with my mother's and husband's help and my husband going out to earn a living for our family with two working legs, indoor plumbing and all the comforts of Western life, it still didn't feel like a cakewalk walk to raise twins. Amelie never complained, Rachel said. I wish the same could be said of me. The article I read that day said a group of maybe 40 of my villagers had been coaxed to return from Liberia with the promise of peace. They camped near the river, families building triangles of stones to cook fires, uh, for cook fires, rice bubbling in pots, men gathering palm fruit, children playing beside their mothers, and then soldiers rolled up a machine gun in a wheelbarrow and opened fire. Mothers tried to strap young ones to their backs, elderly women and men, mothers with children, young and old alike attempted to hide in the dense thorny brush for cover or head toward the river. Rachel came to a photograph of Amelie in the article that took her breath away. I heard the story later from family, Rachel said. Everyone in the village was running from the rebels trying to cross the river that separates Ivory Coast from Liberia. As rebels closed in on Amelie, her son and brother struggled to push her wheelchair through the brush. I'll carry you, one of the young men said. I'll slow you down, Amelie told her son and brother. You, you both go on, leave me here. They'll rape me, but I will survive. You two, they will kill. Go, run. Amelie was wrong, Rachel told me. Or maybe she knew her fate and just wanted her son and brother to save themselves. At the end of the article, Rachel pulled up on her laptop screen that day. She stared at a photograph of Amelie's face, frozen in a scream of terror. 
I will not relate her final brutal inhumane torture. No need for that image to fill anyone else's mind. At last, my, my breathing and heart rate slow, my tears dry, I return to the table with Rachel. So in answer to your question, Rachel looks up and says, what I do is all in honor and memory of Amelie. Somehow from a cup of coffee, only months later, I step off an airplane and walked into a tiny two-room airport in Monrovia where Rachel, our bodyguard and driver, usher me into a white SUV that will would depart the next day for a 13-hour drive through almost impassable red mud jungle roads toward a Liberian refugee camp. Wow, thank you so much. Um, that was riveting. That was really that was really something. And for those of you that are listening, Judy finished writing that today. <laughs> so I think she deserves a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Okay, our next reader is coming to us from, oh, I forget where you're from, Jerry, but she's coming to us from a great distance. She's in Oregon someplace. Jerry Paré, Paré, I think it is, is going to read a coming of age story and the title is Making Pickles. Yeah, I'm from uh, Talent, Oregon. We um, went through the I'll meet a fire um, a year ago and our, our house is, is fine and our town is rebuilding. So this is making pickles. Steam rises from a large steel pot filled with vinegar brine. My eyes sting from the fumes as I stand and stir the pale sepia colored liquid. Simmering bubbles start to show themselves around the edges of the pot, and my glasses fog over. A legion of quart jars stand in rows along the worn laminate counter. Each jar, filled with small, dark green cucumbers, waits for its baptism of salty brine. A bridge over troubled water plays in my head. Geraldine, come in here. My mother's stern voice destroys the silence in her kitchen. The tune in my head crashes like waves against a rocky shoreline as her command echoes off the oak cupboards. The words linger, mixing with the salty steam, and together they catch in my throat. I nibble the inside of my lip to stifle any reaction to her severe tone. I grip the steel stirring spoon tighter. I want to talk with you, she adds, her voice no less sharp, harsh. I shiver. Glancing over my shoulder, my glass is clear. She stands in the doorway of her sewing room, stiff and unmoving. She awaits my answer, like a cobra, ready to strike. Her tone, accusing and severe, snaps me back in time when I cowered under her cutting words. Back then, she supplemented her game of blame and shame with punches or slaps. But I am no longer 11 or 15 or even 21. I am 45, a grown woman. Near my feet, unaware and innocent, my 10-year-old daughter busily lines up quart jars like soldiers ready for orders. She has little experience with the biting timbre of her grandmother's voice. Looking down at her, I smile. I have no intention of moving closer to the old woman in the doorway and rise to my full height. My heart pounds as I wipe my hands on a threadbare tip dish towel and meet her glare. With my daughter close by, a sense of calm washes over me, like the steam rising up from the kettle. This is my stand. Whatever you have to say, can be said right here, what is it? My tone has no hint of a challenge. I understand you took my pickle crops when I was on vacation. Her eyes don't waver from my face. 
Near my station at the stove, two large stoneware crocks are filled to the brim with floating cucumbers. My mind dashes to a hot summer day a few weeks prior when moaning and straining, I loaded two bulky ceramic containers into my car. When I left that airless storeroom, three other crocs remain stoic and silent under cobwebs laden with dead flies and petrified moths. We all got an email saying you wanted the room cleaned out and to take anything we wanted. My daughter gazes up at me from the floor. With her blonde hair, she looks just like me at that age. I want to bend down and tell her, my younger self, I'm happy she's here with me. I smile at my mother and say with confidence, I took two crocs, a big one and a smaller one. My voice is steady and my fingers grip the damp dish towel, glad for its comfort. My mother barely moves and her stance becomes more rigid. With the sun at her back, piles of fabric come into view. A knitting machine sits silent and unused, buffered by large bags of yarn, their colors fading. A tight path leads to her sewing machine. The floor is littered with spools of forgotten thread and snippets of discarded fabric. The hoard behind her seems to expand as she clears her throat. Well, I want them back. I know my answer will seal my fate. No problem. I nod and keep smiling. They're at my house on my deck. Next time you come over, I'll load them in your car. My tone is light and airy. I want to lift her up and brush her with love. I surround her with rainbow colors and beams of light. The words I forgive you will take years to be spoken. 20 years have passed since that late summer morning and eight since she died. The two crocs, one big and one small, sit on the deck. Their sturdy frames hold pots of colored flowers that adorn the entrance to my house. Sometimes I look at them and say the words I never said to her face. I forgive you. Sometimes the words seem directed at myself and make me smile, reminding me of the day I became an adult. Very moving. Thank you, Jerry. That was wonderful. And I didn't realize that, that your town had been affected by the fires. So, gosh, that must have been some experience. Yeah, basically, basically, the town burnt. Yeah. That was really awful, tragic. But I'm glad you're still with us. I'm glad you're still writing. Enjoyed your work. Okay, so our next reader is me. <laughs> I'm going to be reading a, a piece. Um, it's called Summer Snow. It's about a family Christmas gathering in the Southern Hemisphere, where Christmas is in the summer, of course. Okay. Here we go. I'm unmuted, I guess, right? Okay. Summer snow. Paula looks forward all year to the Peterson family Christmas gathering. Her grandparents' off the grid poultry farm, officially known as Peterson's Purveyors of Sustainable Poultry Practices, is heaven on earth for her generation. It's her chance to reconnect with nature, minus the distractions of the modern age. A place where time stands still with agricultural practices plucked from an earlier era. Nothing wasted. Grandmom and granddad use everything from meat to feathers. Paula relishes the old timey tasks involved in the poultry business. Grandmom and granddad get a respite from the daily demands while aunts and uncles direct cousins in scalding, plucking and butchering. Cousins Preston and Parker are responsible for cutting off chicken feet. They irresponsibly threaten Paula's little sister, Priscilla, with them. She runs to Paula for protection. Paula, Priscilla, and cousin Peggy pluck feathers while older cousins refine their gutting technique. After a day in the summer sunshine processing poultry, Paula and her cousins join the many aunts and uncles, grandmom and granddad in the house. As lights dim, kerosene lamps are lit. The adults retell family stories and pull out handicrafts. 
Paula sneaks off with cousins to play board games or snoop in the attic for clues to their parents' pasts. On the night of grandmom and granddad's, oh, excuse me, on the last night at grandmom and granddad's, cousins split into tribal allegiances. Girls on one side, boys on the other. The aunts and uncles ceremoniously cart the ammo upstairs. Paula lifts a poorly stitched muslin case, muslin case from the crate. She holds it aloft and spins it above her head as she lets out a piercing war cry. Yay, 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 yay. The room erupts, tribes charge. Paula's weapon finds its mark and explodes in a rain of down. Pillows destroyed, cousins scoop feathers and throw them into the air. They fall like a summer snow. Thank you. Okay, so one of our readers was unable to make it tonight, so we're going to skip him, and we're going to go directly on to Linda Sather, and she will be reading a coming-of-age um, story entitled Maddie's Song. Welcome, Linda. Hi, thank you. So I'm reading an excerpt from the coming of age novel I've written about a young woman, Maddie, who goes to Alaska in 1973. This scene occurs early in the story when Maddie is on the way to Alaska with her friend, Rachel. The 400 foot ferry dwarfed its surroundings as it sailed majestically up to the dock, looking like a stout royal dowager gliding into the throne room. The fairy proudly flaunted the state colors. A gold stripe ran around the blue hull and the smokestack sported gold stars in the shape of the Big Dipper and the North Star. North to the future, I thought as I shivered with excitement. I wanted to savor the moment, but Rachel was already rushing us on board and up a series of stairs leading to the top deck. Hurry, she urged over her shoulder. We've got to get to the solarium before it fills up. What's the solarium, I asked, as Rachel pushed open a heavy door leading to the outside. A roof extended, out, extended over most of the deck, with ceiling heaters spaced every 20 feet, making the area underneath marginally warmer than the exposed deck beyond. Damn, Rachel said, looking around. The lounge chairs are already taken. Never mind, we can squeeze our bags here under this heater. I copied Rachel, rolling my sleeping bag out on the concrete floor and propping my backpack at the head. How'd you know what to do? I asked when I saw the disappointed people who came after us. I got a few tips about working in Petersburg before we left, she said. Like what else? I asked, perturbed she hadn't bothered to share any of this with me earlier. Oh, I don't remember. Like needing rain boots. Rain boots, I don't have any, me neither. What else? Like how everything is expensive in Alaska, but you can make good money and use birth control. The guys are hot. The ferry whistle blew two loud blasts and sailed slowly north into Puget Sound. I watched from the stern as Seattle diminished in size and then disappeared. I knew the city hadn't really shrunk. The vehicles and structure hadn't changed but my perspective had, I was moving forward. I tore my eyes from the scenery and scanned Rachel. She'd grown incredibly thin since I'd last seen her, too thin. Her eyes, already, always dark, now looked impenetrable, as though they took everything in and gave nothing back, like black holes in space. What are you staring at, she asked sharply. Traveling with Rachel was like having one of those companion dogs guiding their owners around stores, aloof but vigilant, wearing a vest that screamed, don't pet me. Rachel was loyal but wary, buy me a beer but don't stroke my fur. I'd seen her bite without warning when someone got too close. You look like you've lost weight, I settled on saying. You look like you haven't, she retorted. Keep an eye on our stuff while I find the bathroom. It's called the head on a boat, I corrected. It's called a ship, not a boat, Rachel retorted. 
She threaded her way through the clutter of bodies and baggage to the heavy door leading inside. An hour later, she returned, yawned, and plopped down on her bag. About time, I said, staring at my watch. My turn. When I got back to the solarium, Rachel sat cross-legged on a sleeping bag while a young man with shoulder length hair played a guitar and another guy blew notes into a harmonica. Hey guys, Rachel said, this is Maddie. Maddie, this is Jake and John, said the other. Get in, I said, you were just playing the Beatles, right? The harmonica player smiled hopefully. Did you like it? Really nice, I complimented. Mm, that kind of pitchy, Rachel countered. Oh, everyone's a critic, they laughed. They're going to sick to go fishing, Rachel cut in, patting Jake, the guitar player, on the forearm, clearly claiming him as hers. I told them we're going to Petersburg. Petersburg's nice, he said, but our uncle fishes us out of Sitka, so that's where we're going. And lucky he took us on, the other added. So how do you two know each other, Jake asked. We were roommates in college, I explained. The school matched us up based on a lame personality test. The amazing thing was how well we'd hit it off. Rachel could be exasperating, but deep inside I thought she was pretty cool. I wasn't sure what she thought of me. Maybe we were just both left over when everyone else was matched up, Rachel laughed. You know, the misfits. I was a little offended, but the guys laughed. Alaska is full of misfits, Jake said. Like up here, you're not really part of it. And we're not, John cut in. Look at a map. Alaska isn't even connected to the rest of the US. Anywhere that's not in Alaska is considered outside, not the outside, just outside with a capital O. Even Hawaii is outside. It doesn't matter if it's connected or not. We might go there next winter, Jake said, flirting with Rachel. Wanna come? Sorry, we're off to Mexico this winter, I cut in. Right, Rachel? Right, she said, looking slightly regretful. She and the guitar player were sitting closer together than necessary, even in the cramped quarters of the solarium. As the music and chatter resumed, I thought about the banjo and the other things and people I'd left behind. Hey, the harmonica player said, interrupting my reverie. You look like you've disappeared somewhere. Oh, sorry. I looked around. Rachel was gone, the guitar player too. The harmonica player slipped his instrument in his pocket of, the wool, of his wool shirt. You wanna share a joint, he asked. I knew what he was really asking to share. I considered him briefly. Cute, yes, but the deck beneath our sleeping bags was hard and cold. The lights in the solarium dim, but always on, and too many other bodies were sprawled nearby. I had nothing against a fling, but I wasn't feeling it. No thanks, I said. I lay down in my sleeping bag, and with a potent feel of motion beneath me as the ferry turned north, I quickly fell into a flimsy, dreamless sleep. And that's it for that chapter. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Okay. And for those of you who have, who have been reading, don't forget to look in the chat because people are saying nice things um, about the readings, so. Don't forget to look at those. Okay, so we have one last reader, and that is Paige Farrow. Did I say your last name right? Good. And she she will um, be reading um, Old Lang Sign. So go ahead, Paige. Thank you. Hi everyone. One second. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? I've been having some audio issues. Okay, I'm getting nods. Hi, thanks for allowing me to jump in like this. I don't often participate in these ways and I was invited by the Central Oregon Writers Guild to do this and I'm really happy to. I have been published in short fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and the secret is that it's all actually just nonfiction. So this is my fictitious nonfiction, we'll call it creative, uh, New Year's Eve story to round out the evening for you. Old Lang Sign. The house stood on a hill, windows lit from within. Every so often, the pass of shadow across the window denoted the merrymaking inside. 
The glow is a beacon to light up the scraggly valley that was the town of Phillipsburg, Montana. Population 820. Now plus an extra 10 adults, one two-year-old and three dogs. We were guests at this house for the weekend. My father, grandfather, and siblings together again for New Year's for the first time in almost 12 years. Phillipsburg in its heyday was a mining town. Like so many towns in Montana, after the gold and silver and sapphires no longer flowed from the riverbeds steadily into the miners' hands, the town was steadily deserted. Tacked together ramshackle shacks were left where they leaned, campfires were doused, Wagons were loaded, horses leashed, and off they went. Those who sought their fortunes from the dust. In the dark, Phillipsburg was a single mountainside, sloped with trickles of lights creeping down to a dark valley. Silhouettes of houses and stores lingered in the dark, surrounding the spots of light. Dusty, dry snow blew across the road, but didn't stick. Not much of a town, is it? My brother-in-law said. My sister scrolled through the digital map, lighting up the paper white of her screen. Go straight, and then it's the second or third left. There were no stoplights to mark our turns, but crooked green road signs half lost in the dark. We often didn't see them until we'd already passed. Where's the damn road? My sister shook her head, I don't know. I couldn't tell if we're still going the right way. The map isn't loading anymore, I don't know. My finger pressed white against the cool glass of the car window. Wait, is that it? Is that a road? I knew the minute I said it that this was not what we wanted. It was a sliver of a trail cut into the grass of the hill. It was a walking path at most, but my brother-in-law had already jerked the wheel to the left. The truck dipped forward into the drainage ditch and then nosed back up. My sister's words were lost in the rev of the engine as my brother-in-law stepped hard on the gas. I think she said something like, oh shit, no. But it was too late. Up, up, up we went, and then nothing. We did not move. The engine revved again, and we lurched forward once, still at that unreasonable pitch. There was nothing to hold on to under our tire treads. I could hear the dogs whining in their kennels in the bed of the truck. The kennels we had decided did not need tying down. That was when we began to tip backwards. There was a harsh squeal I couldn't recognize as human or dog or machine, and then everything was sliding. I gripped the baby's car seat hard, and there was another screech of metal grinding on metal. And then we were there, creeping over the edge of the side yard onto the gravel driveway, lit by twinkle lights. The road not taken stretched off the driveway to the right. The house was quiet the next morning, a rarity and a blessing when in the presence of a toddler. I met my father on the landing before below where he was leashing the golden retriever puppy. He asked me to start the coffee while he took the dog out for a quick walk. I scooped fresh grounds from the bag on the counter and set the French press to the deep. Outside, snow clouds hung heavy. The wood crackled in the squat black fireplace. It was New Year's Eve, the last day of the year. We spent the day in downtown Phillipsburg. The vestiges of holiday trimming lingered on doorways and black iron railings along the quiet main street. We wandered in and out of little shops selling gemstones mined from the hills, specialty wines and jammed and pickled things. We huddled in the warm brewery next to big silver vats of grain and malt. We found familiar faces in the crowd, old family friends with whom we swapped Christmas stories reminiscences and our hopes for the new year to come. That night, we feasted on spaghetti and Caesar salad and loaves of crusty bread smeared with garlic and butter. Huge pots of noodles and sauce with thick chunks of steak crowded the stove and the whole kitchen smelled of garlic. We popped champagne and bubbly apple cider and cheered and hugged one another and chanted, Happy New Year. We did not make it to midnight but took cups and mugs of coffee and small plates of cake into the living room and sat before the fire, playing blocks with the baby and keep away from the dogs with our plates. One by one, we slowly staggered up to bed. I fell asleep listening to my grandfather snoring in the room next door and the muffled whispers of my brother and his fiance still awake below. 
I packed my bag slowly on the last morning of our stay. I stood with my father on the back patio, tucked under his arm, as we stared out across the valley of blue and gold mountains. We didn't talk. We just stood, looking out onto all the new year had brought us. There are moments in the final days of the year's end when a sort of melancholy roots in my chest. The Christmas lights come down. The houses, once brightly lit, now sit dark on the street corners. Brittle pine needles are swept from the floor. Boxes of ornaments and decorations packed away again until next year. Life, it seems, returns to normal. I end, I mourn the end of the merriment. But at the end of the year marks for us the chance to reflect as much as it allows us to look forward. I must remember that there is so much to look forward to, so much to be grateful for. Hearing my nephew laugh, those little boy giggles that light up the house, talking with my grandfather, gleaning those bits of wisdom that only come from living and seeing all that he has in his 85 years. Not tipping the truck in a rush to get there to start the fun already. The end of the year brings us an invitation to take our time, to take in the sunrises with our families, and to take in the beauty of this world. And oh, what a beautiful world it is. Isn't it just? Thank you. Thank you, Paige. That was lovely. Well, everybody, that concludes our reading. Um, thank you for everyone who participated, who, who, everyone who read, and everyone who listened. Um, Mike, do you have anything to add? Just thank you all very much. That was lovely. That was an excellent way to spend a Tuesday night. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming. I look forward to seeing you um, in person and or in via Zoom again in uh, January. Um, happy holidays to everyone. That's it. Go have fun. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, you guys. Thanks for being here. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas, Christmas everyone. Thank you for all the sharing. Yeah, thank you for all the sharing.